Welcome, church. Let us stand for the call to worship, and it is found in Psalm 107, 17. Some were fools through their sinful ways, and because of their iniquities suffered affliction. They loathed any kind of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for, Lord, for dying on the cross and for saving us, Father, for saving us from ourselves and from our sinful ways. Lord, we dedicate the service to you and we love you, Father. We pray that you may receive all of the glory and all of the honor today and forever and ever. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
You may be seated. My name is Tony Guzman. I'm one of the elders here at the church. Uh, Pastor Dave and his wife, Janine, are traveling this weekend, visiting uh, with some family. And later on, our retired Pastor Bill Malik will be bringing us the word this week. And before I get going, you may have noticed outside uh, the new signs that are painted on the wall. So we've got a quick and really quick little video to show you a little bit of the work that happened this week. There should be some background music with that, I think. Thank you for that. Okay. It was a lot of hard work, and I, they did a great job. It really looks great out there. So a couple announcements uh, for this week. For those uh, that have not had opportunity yet to join us, uh, Marcella is actually running through uh, Hiding His Word. It's on Monday nights, starting at 9 p.m. She runs it really quick, about 15, 20 minutes, going through memory, uh, verse memorization, and going through the Growing in Christ series. So please contact her if you haven't joined yet and you'd like to get more information, she can give you the details but we meet on Monday nights at 9 p.m. Then this is the first week for Pursuit Nights moving to Monday nights, uh, and they are at 6.30. 7.30. 30. 7.30. Oh, I knew it was a 30. At 7.30 uh, that they're meeting. Then on Tuesday nights, Pastor Dave's uh, community group uh, meets. On Wednesday nights, David's uh, Spanish Bible study runs. And then on Thursday nights, we had our first week last week, of the, uh, the marriage course that ran. We're actually doing that here in person as well as over Zoom. And we have adjusted the time uh, where we're looking to start the study exactly by 6.30. So because we're doing some meal time, some fellowship time at the front end, please uh, strive to be here by six. 
so we can go ahead and, and spend some time in fellowship and uh, eat together, and then get started with the study at 6.30. It is running and probably will run closer to about a two-hour time period, so until about 8, 8.30 each Thursday night, so that's why we want to make sure to start exactly at 6.30. All right, um, and that is it for announcements. So um, we'll move on to the next one. We'll actually do offering now, so if the deacons could uh, go ahead and collect the offering. Thank you. Ha uh -huh. 
the storm that surrounds me. Just one word, the darkness has to retreat. morning. It's wonderful to be with you today. Uh, in this particular type of time that we're in, the message that we're talking about is uh, very specifically honed right for us. In the Gospel of Luke in chapter 10, Jesus uh, says something that he never says at any other time in his entire life or ministry. Jesus uh, has been with his disciples 
started obviously his ministry after being born in Bethlehem, now living in Nazareth and then up to Capernaum. And Jesus chooses his 12. He does that by prayer. Jesus not only prays for them as to which of the hundreds of people he's going to choose, but he begins to pray on a daily basis as to the ministry that is going to be conducted. Jesus is very much involved and in charge of discipling his his 12. The things that Jesus do, does with them, what he teaches them, are all designed to not only be a reflection of his glory for them, but for us. To give us insight as to what we should live for, what we should do, the decisions that we should make. Jesus now sends in an unusual way, not his 12 disciples out. He's done that before, sending them out, telling them what to do, giving them instructions, giving them a pattern for their ministry afterwards. They don't understand that, but that's what's happening. But now Jesus chooses 70. You might say, why 70? Well, I don't know. I have no idea. But some said, well, 70 is the number of the Sanhedrin. 70 is the, the number of nations that were mentioned. But it's a, a group of 70. And he pairs them up together. And he sends them out. Now, they go out, not just hither, skither, but he sends them out with specific instructions, what they should do, what they should say, what their ministry is. It might be called a canned ministry. Some people say to me, uh, I don't like using little gospel tracts. I use the four spiritual laws. Some people say, I don't like that. I was asking, well, what do you use? Well, I don't use anything. I said, well, I, I like the four spiritual laws better than nothing. And uh, he gives them a canned presentation. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. They're told what to do, where to go, where not to go, how to respond if they're rejected, and he sends them out. And as they now return, something happens in the ministry that gives Jesus phenomenal confidence that his ministry, which is coming to an end as they're now on their way to Jerusalem, Jesus to die there, Jesus has tremendous confidence that his ministry may be ending, but the ministry of the gospel is really just beginning. And so let's take a minute and pray and ask God to really speak to our hearts and to teach us. Wherever you are, it's very easy to be distracted by pets and doggies and cats and and in drinks and whatever. Let's see for the next 35 minutes if we can't concentrate and ask God to speak to us. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who called us to himself, we pray that your spirit would fill our hearts. Father, be with me as I share these words as I preach. Father, I pray that uh, anything that I might say which would be inaccurate or unhelpful, that you would erase it from people's minds. 
I pray, Father, that uh, we would listen very intently as to what you want us to know. And we pray in the name of Jesus Christ with thanksgiving. And pray this with me just to yourself. Lord Jesus, speak to me. Lord Jesus, speak to me. Amen. Okay. The title of the message, and as Dave has been going through the gospel, what is the gospel? What does the gospel mean in your life and my life? Now, this picture he's asked me to give is what does the gospel mean in the life, in the ministry of Jesus Christ himself? And so the title I've chosen is The Gospel is Victory for Christ. So now let's, and you might turn in your Bible to the Gospel of Luke and Luke chapter 10. Remember, you can mark in your Bible, I have mine marked all over the place. It helps us take notes and to remember what God tells us and impresses us with. Here we go. Luke chapter 10, and we start at verse 17. The, the 70 have returned. The 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I was watching, Satan fall from heaven like lightning. What an amazing picture that must have been for the Lord to say. Behold, I have given you authority, Jesus continues. I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing will injure you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your name, your names are recorded in heaven. What he's saying to them is, look, the, the events of ministry, which are very exciting, which are wonderful, which are captivating to our minds and imagination, it's great, but it's not anything in comparison to the privilege of walking with God, knowing God, and knowing we have a destination, that your name is written down in heaven, and that place is already reserved for you. And so he says to them, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. At that very time, he rejoiced, he rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit. Stop. You won't find another verse in which those words are mentioned in all four Gospels in the 1,860 chapters of the Bible. This is the only time that you'll ever read these words that he, at this time, he rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit. Something happened. Something happened that's, that captivated Jesus' heart, his mind, his emotions. And here's what it is. These words are his prayer. I praise you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for this way was well-pleasing in your sight. All these things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills 
to reveal him. Remember that. Did you catch that word? Anyone whom the Son chooses to reveal him. God has called you and me, and he's called us with a special calling to know him. John 6 and verse 44, no one, no one comes to the Father, says Jesus, excuse me, let me start again. John 6, 44, no one comes to me, Jesus said, unless the Father who sent me draws him. If you're a Christian, if you feel that pull on your heart, it's not your imagination. It's not your mind. It's not a bad pizza that you had yesterday. God is pulling you and drawing you and moving you towards him for a purpose. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. That's what the book of Hebrews says, that Jesus Christ himself, the founder, the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and seated at the right hand of God. The joy set before him, this joy, this rejoicing, spoken of in Luke 10, in Hebrews 12, verse 2, is the joy of knowing, Jesus knowing, that his ministry, this wonderful, phenomenal ministry, the ministry that generations now of 2,000 years have been captivated and talking about, disputing about, <laughs> contending against, and loving, whether a person be a Christian or a non-Christian, people are talking about Jesus. And not always the best thing, but they're talking about his life and his ministry and his words, which are absolutely unsurpassed. And this is the ministry that Jesus has called us. Now we are generation after generation after generation removed from the 70, but we're called in the same way to minister, to minister not necessarily alone. If we are alone, then we talk to people about Christ, but to prefer, preferably to go with someone to talk with somebody who loves Christ, who can pray for you when you speak, and you can pray for them while they speak. Now, we said this message is called Christ's victory. Here's the picture of it. What's it victory over? Number one, it's victory over sin, over the debt of sin, the debt of sin which we owe in Christ paid for that on the cross. In the Gospel of John, at the scene of the crucifixion, Jesus says, it is finished. What does the word, it is finished, mean? In Greek, it means paid in full. Paid in full. What is paid in full? All of our sins, all of our failures, all of the past, present, and future sins that we commit. And by the way, practically, start coming to a point in your prayer life where you begin to realize how great the work of Christ is in paying for your sins. And here's how to do that. Do not pray, oh Lord, please forgive me for this sin. What would that mean? Please forgive me. Well, it means you're looking for something you don't have. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 17, and their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember. No more. No more. 
So when you confess a sin, and you need to confess your sins as you do your sins, when it comes to your mind, ah, that wasn't truthful, ah, that was lust, say immediately, Lord Jesus, thank you for forgiving me for that sin. Thank you for forgiving me for that sin, because you're going, you need to be living constantly in the shadow of the forgiveness of the cross. Your victory can only be found in the cross of Christ, in the forgiveness of your sins. Secondly, victory over Satan's domain. Satan is called by Jesus in John 10, the God of this world. He has dominance over the minds of people. Really, do I, have to, do I have to say more about that today? In such a strange and unusual day, I'm, I'm 72 years old. I know I don't look it, but I am 72. And I've never seen anything like this. I've never seen anything like this. When Vietnam was ripping the uh, ripping at the walls of congress and tearing people apart no one spoke the words there the leadership were were we are engulfed in evil people and this is not from themselves they can't control themselves hate is a fire which is kindled by Satan himself. And if they open the furnace, he'll fill it up and they can't control themselves. We are saved from the dominion of Satan. But by the way, hang on, we're gonna talk about what we need to do to keep ourselves sharp in that area. Thirdly, victory over our old nature. <laughs> over our old nature. Roman says this, that sin will not reign over you anymore. The word reign is the word that would be used for a prince, a king, a queen, reigning over a province. Sin is not going to reign over you anymore. Since you have received Christ, you've taken him into your life, you are following him, then you can sing that song. It ain't gonna rain no more, no more. It ain't gonna rain no more. Satan is not gonna rain over us anymore. You could probably sing that better than me, but you got the impression of what it was about. So we have victory or Christ has victory over our alienation. Boy, I gotta tell you, there are times I work on a message and Certain things hit me and certain things pass by. But this one hit me like a ton of bricks. We have friends that we know. Many of you know them very, very close. And they've adopted children. Christ has adopted us. I watch on Facebook the face of those parents who have their adopted children in their arms, kissing them, taking them to buy ice cream and to Disney World. And you just see the radiance of love and acceptance. This is my child. This is my child. But it's an adopted child. We, you and I, have been adopted, Romans 8 says, into God's family. When Saul, who was persecuting the church in Romans chapter 8, comes into a face-to-face -face contact with Jesus Christ, who, by the way, has already been crucified, buried, resurrected, 40 days spent with the disciples, but now resides in heaven, and in Tremendous splendor, light surrounds Saul and he falls down. 
and everyone with him is terrorized and runs away. Saul hears the words, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me? But Saul was persecuting the church. That's right. The first lesson that Saul ever learned was the lesson that to touch a Christian is to touch Jesus Christ. We are his adopted children. We are in the family. I have this weekend my family coming, my five daughters and seven grandchildren, and we're going to somehow all live and sleep and eat in this house. And it's going to be uncomfortable, believe me, going from Karen, myself, and two dogs to 13 other people is going to be an unusual experience, but I look forward to it. I relish it. I am hungry for it. I can't wait to see them, to embrace them, and to look for a place to sit down while I talk to them, because every place will be taken. But that's my family. We are in God's eternal family, his forever family. And we belong in that family. We're accepted in that family. There's another point I want to I want to make here. We have victory over stagnation. We don't have to be the same. We don't have to be the same. We don't have to be less effective. We don't have to be less profitable, less fruitful. We have we living within us the spirit of God, the holy spirit of God. And he is the one who gives us the power to control ourselves and to speak and to endure. And he gives us the fruit of the spirit, which we'll see in a minute more about. But we don't have to stagnate. We don't have to say, oh, yeah, but I'm retired now. I'm retired now. We need to understand the power of God. Let me tell you a story on this. I had something amazing happen. Karen and I returned from Poland where we were missionaries and we served behind the Iron Curtain. But we returned from Poland after three years and I became a pastor of Holiday Park Baptist Church in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Now I used to be the uh, Campus Crusade Director at the campus in the University of Pittsburgh. And, and the, uh, the director who was there then asked if I would speak to that group. And I agreed that I would. And the most amazing thing happened. I spoke, I, I didn't know anybody there. Uh, I spoke and I left and that was it. And <clears throat> I didn't want to speak. <laughs> we had come back and we had we had we lived in a parsonage and there was hardly any furniture and there were mattresses, a few that we could sleep on. We had no television or or even dishware. And we had didn't have a car. I had to borrow it to go down there. I didn't want to go down there. But I remember the conversation I had with the Lord when I did go down there. And I talked about the fact that. I didn't want to waste his time and I, I wanted to minister to my family. I didn't want to go. Even though I knew, I was pretty sure he wanted me to go. But I said, okay, Lord, fill me with the spirit and somehow use this. But I didn't ever hear anything from it. Well, two days ago, I spoke to my daughter, my oldest daughter who lives in New York City. And she said to me, my grandchild, whose name is Samantha, is going to another church for a youth group meeting because there's no youth group in her church. 
And when Samantha went there, her mother, my daughter, Michelle, had called the pastor. I didn't know him. Uh, and uh, nobody knew him, but she met the pastor, called him. He talked to her quite a bit, got background information, and, um, and said, I'll be glad to welcome Samantha to the youth group. And about 40 or 50 people, kids were there when Samantha came through the door. And pastor, his name is Ed. Ed said, oh, you, you're Samantha. And she smiled and she, of course, a little embarrassed and wanted to get down to a place where she could be like everyone else. He said, oh, no, 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 you got to stand up here for a minute. He said, you know, I know something about Samantha that Samantha doesn't even know. Well, Samantha was freaked out. What was this? And he said, I know your grandfather. That, that's me. It's hard for me to think of myself as a grandfather, but I am, and I'm her grandfather. He says, I know your grandfather. Honestly, I don't know him. And he said to her, he said, God used him in a mighty way in my life when I was deciding whether I would use my university degree and put it on the side and go instead to seminary to be a pastor. He said, uh, if you see him, tell him, I remember the line that he gave concerning the people, the communists who were after him. He said, uh, the line was, they can kill me, but they can't eat me because cannibalism's against the law. <laughs> Hardly a profound line, but that's what it was. And I did say that. And he said, when I heard that, I thought, that's right. Uh, they can kill me, but they can't eat me. So I can face my parents. I can face the people who think I'm crazy. I can face the fears that going into the seminary, going into the pastorate isn't going to work, but I'm going to do it anyway. And I made a decision not to be afraid. By the way, if you're afraid of something, that's what you need to remember. Maybe that's a word for you. But here we are 45 years later, and I hear of what God did using a word I said 45 years ago. But believe me, that's not me. That's the Holy Spirit of God. And you and I have the opportunity to not be stagnant in our life, but to be fruitful in all of the things that we do, because it's the Spirit of God speaking through us, living through us, ministering through us to the very people. We don't know what's going on in their life, but God does. And he says, don't be afraid of what to say. I'll give you the words. I'll give you the words. And then lastly, in this victory, is it's victory over our eternity. It's a victory over our eternity. We know where we are going. I've seen in this time of COVID, a number of people get sick and pass away. I've been around a lot of people who have either had or are afraid of COVID. And there's a tremendous difference between people who know Christ and are following Christ and those who do not know him. And it makes a big difference in a person's life because there's a big difference in a person's eternity, a big difference in a person's eternity. Now, let me show you another thing. This is exactly what Jesus has left for us. And that's the Holy Spirit living in us. And spirit produces fruit. The Holy Spirit produces fruit. And spirit produced fruit involves attitudes. Attitudes that you and I have. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. 
Anyone need self-control? <laughs> All of that is his fruit, which he produces in us when we daily yield to him. Daily, we need to be in communion with him. And in communion with him, we become sanctified. It's sanctified, which means prepared for a holy purpose. Actions. The Spirit of God produces actions in us. And Titus puts it very well. He said, this is a faithful saying, and it's worthy of complete and total acceptance that those who know Christ need to do good works. You need to do something with your life. You need to do something with your life for Christ's sake that will bring Christ to the forefront. I have plants that are now growing around my tree. Those plants I didn't plant, but a woman planted who is from Poland. She goes to the church I go to. Her husband died and I did the funeral. And my neighbor next door who I've been praying for for the last four years that I could talk to him came over to my wife and said, could you ask Bill if he could show me the kind of plants or get the plants to put around my tree because they kind of grow up around the tree and it's a vine and I don't know what it's called, but she does. And I'm going to do that. Why? Because it's a good work. It's a good work with which the gospel can come forward and maybe I can invite him over for a barbecue and maybe we can go one step after another step, after another step. Worship. Oh, tough to worship when we're not together. But when we have the ability, when you find the comfort in your mind to go to worship, you do that. I, I did that here. Where I go to Suncoast Community Church, I've been watching it on Zoom. I've been faithful on that. But I thought, well, you know, I, I kind of like it here. I drink my coffee. I don't need to go back. But I did. And I sat there. And the ambiance of my brothers and sisters who love Christ and who sing and who greet me, and we practice social distancing and the whole thing. But just being there, seeing them, and sacrificing, putting my clothes on, going out the door, that's something that Christ calls us to, and he's worthy of it. Gospel telling. <laughs> Romans chapter 1, Paul says, I'm eager to come to you in Rome to speak to you about Christ, to bring forth fruit. Truth telling, we are to be people in Ephesians chapter five and verse nine, who speak truth to one another and to everyone else. You know and I know, lying is a practice with which people get the Academy Awards, literally, for their lies, not just on a movie, but on presentations, in speeches, whatever. We need to be people of the truth. We need to speak truth and understand that's not your inclination, and it's definitely not my inclination. I was raised as a child in an atmosphere for some reason that I became a liar. I mean, I was a terrible liar. My grandmother said to me at the age of 12, you are a professional liar. She said, you're an amazing liar. She said, you lie when you really don't even have to lie. And you know what? She was absolutely right. She was absolutely right, and I couldn't shake it. No matter what I did, I couldn't shake it until I gave my life to Christ. I became a Christian, 
And I began to ask God to give me the ability to tell the truth. Why? Well, because we are to reflect his truth and we are to be believed and we're not to be controlled by fear, which is one of the primary reasons we lie because we're afraid. And then abundant giving. The fruit of the spirit. He gives us the generosity in our heart to give. Life is tough. Life is hard now. But I went to my own pastor and I said to him, uh, his name is Kevin here. I said, we have a bigger church. We have a big church, actually, 300 people. And I said, my heart is really for the needs of pursuit. And I wanted to know if, if it would be okay if I tithe to pursuit, if I give my tithe on a monthly basis to pursuit. He's my spiritual authority. I wouldn't do that without asking him, even though I am a pastor of sorts, a retired pastor. But he said to me, you go do that. He said, you go do that. Churches are falling apart and it's Satan's desire to destroy churches. I want to encourage you to give to pursuit, to give to the church. This is your church. And your heart needs to be there. Don't let it be cold. This is a reflection of the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of God is the one who produces that fruit. One last thing. All of this is for our sanctification. Sanctification is to be made holy. We've received Christ. He's holy. His spirit lives in us. He's holy. We need to be holy. Start every day by asking God before your feet touch the rug, Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit. I give you this day. I give you this day. Secondly, Trust the Lord that he will lead you and guide you in everything that's going to happen that day. He's going to lead you through every conversation. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart, says Proverbs 3, 4, and 5. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And don't lean to your own understandings. In all of your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. That's the promise. And as you trust that promise, you grow in the manner of holiness before God and usefulness to his kingdom by his word. We are sanctified by his word, by reading his word, by memorizing his word, by putting his word in our heart. I am very interested in the fact that I saw on Pursuit, there is an opportunity to be involved in a class, and that class is for memorization. I became a Christian in 1968. That's over 50 years ago. And I guess it was six months, maybe three months after I became a Christian, the person who had who had ambushed me and got me in a Billy Graham meeting where I gave my life to Christ, she handed me a little booklet. And it was by the Navigators. And it was called Scripture Memorization, little cards. I think there were 11. And I began memorizing them. I don't know whatever happened to those, but I still have those cards. By the way, I just used one in Proverbs 3, 4, and 5. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. I memorized that there. Now, after 50 years of ministry, if you ask me, uh, Bill, what has been 
the most helpful thing in your ministry? Was it uh, being on staff uh, and learning all the techniques of sharing Christ when you were with Campus Crusade for Christ? Uh, or w w was it maybe seminary when you went to seminary? And, or, or maybe it was when you became a pastor and you learned how to preach. Uh, maybe it was when you took those counseling classes. Maybe, 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 uh -uh. not even close. The number one thing which will equip you to be a good husband or wife or a young person, the number one thing which will defeat Satan when he tempts you, the number one thing that will equip you for every good conversation is one word, memorization. It's a pretty long word. Maybe it's, you could break it up, memorization. So a couple of words. But anyhow, you put those words in your heart and you'll be amazed at the opportunities that you will have to use them in conversations and when questions arise, things which you would never think of and all of a sudden it'll pop out. Dawson Trotman, who was the one who started that little memorization class in the 40s, right after World War II, he used to say this, he said, you memorize and God will use those verses that you memorize as arrows in your quiver and he will take the arrow out and put it on the bow of your lips and pierce a heart for himself. And that's precisely been my experience. You'll never waste your time memorizing scripture. It is the number one pillar of every Christian's life or should be. That's what uh, uh, Psalm 119 verse nine and verse 11 says. It asks a question, how in the world can a young person keep his way from evil? And then verse 11 is the answer by taking heed, by listening to the word of God. Thy word I've hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Hiding the word in your heart will give you power against the sins which have beaten you to the ground by praying, by praying every day, by fellowship with other Christians, either by phone. There's a, there's a guy, his name is Frank, and he calls me every Thursday. And every Thursday, we pray together and I do a little Bible reading and we talk about Philippians, and that's uh, a favorite book of mine. Uh, there are several people I talk to. I talk with Dave every week. We pray together. We talk together. Is there somebody you can fellowship with? Is there a reason you can't come to church to worship? Is there a reason you can't unite yourself? The Bible is very clear in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, it says, don't forsake the assembling of yourself together, as is the habit of some, but all the more, every day, think about how you can encourage other people, how you can encourage them. I, on Wednesday, had two guys over, not for a Bible study. They had called me, one individually of the other, and they're in a modeling club. We make plastic models. And they said, hey, can I come over? Uh, I wonder if I could come over. I said, sure, come on over. So they came over at one o'clock and they were here from one to five. And then one guy left and, uh, I had work to do on this message. And maybe you're saying at this point, yeah, I should have worked more on it. But anyhow, I had work to do on this message. And I, I thought, what am I gonna do? And I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll, I'll just take my Bible and I'll start studying it right in front of him. And I did for three hours. And 
out of the corner of my eye, I could see him looking at me, constantly looking at me. At the end of that time, he talked to me about what was in his heart for his life and about what he wanted to do for someone else that he knows, a common friend that he's close to. He said, but I don't know what to say to them. I listened to you and and I, you seem to know what to say. I, I quote scripture because <laughs> I've been memorizing it. And he said, I, I'd really like to know how to do that. I said to him, I said, I challenge you to become a disciple of mine. I said, you don't have to say yes or no right now, but you tell God no before you tell me no, or God yes before you tell me yes. We'll get together next week. I said, let me pray for you. We bowed and I prayed and I lifted my eyes and I couldn't believe it. This guy who's a pretty tough guy was weeping. He was wiping his eyes from tears. That was the work of God. That was the work of God. God wants to use you. He wants to build you. He wants you to be a sanctified instrument of his touch. So let's pray right now as we consider the way that Christ rejoiced at the fall of Satan and that his influence was broken Let's consider the breaking of his influence in your life. Pray with me. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, for the gift of eternal life, for the salvation that he has purchased, for making us his children, adopted children for uniting us together as one family, as one body, as one church. We pray that the things that we've heard, we would incorporate in our daily life, in our daily walk, that Monday when we get up and we start the day, that we would start it by asking you to fill us with your spirit, that we would on that day, find ourselves in your word, memorizing even just one little verse and allowing you to direct our life, our conversation in every way. Use us for Christ's sake that we might experience in our lives the victory that Christ experienced in his ministry here on earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us stand. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Oh.
And now for the benediction, which is the blessing. Pray with me. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this message and these words which we've heard the Lord Jesus Christ say as he rejoiced saying, I withheld, beheld, Satan falling like lightning from heaven. In this day, in this week, might we take specific measures to consciously be careful how we walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of our time for you. Might we embrace your word, not just as a hobby, but as a passion. May your life be and your word be our air that we breathe. And Father, might we grow in energy, in stamina, and in strength, and that we might be able to minister to people that you are preparing, even people that we've never thought of before, that we might be free of Satan and his temptations, and Father, that we might be break the bonds which have held us down for Jesus' sake, in his power and for his glory. And everybody said, Amen and Amen. God bless you so much. There's nothing I love that you guys God all. can do.